um, and a number of other people gave talks there. But a lot of the time was spent not so much talking, but uh, in actually with plans to move forward. Um, I don't know how many of you know this, but um, the Semantic Web Group at ESIP now is the proud governance board for the suite ontologies, which have been finally freed from uh, JPL control, and they're now open, open source. And so that community has been pretty active in updating the ontologies, and more importantly, uh, bringing them into uh, alignment with um, Obo Foundry style um, ontologies, in particular, trying to make Sweet, Envo, and Chebby, which are the three Obo Foundry related ontology sets that were um, uh, that sh they should become interoperable over time. So, so that was a good output there. Secondly. Um, there's this work with YAMZ, YAMZ, Y-A-M-Z dot net, which is a place that people can put terms and their definitions, um, intended mostly for science communities who are working on glossaries um, to agree or disagree on term definitions. And uh, it's supported by the California Digital Libraries and uses ARCs as permalinks, which are internationally uh, replicated so that the links should not expire with time, which is always a problem with semantics and ontologies, unless it's a very um, well-respected international body. But so this provides some level of security uh, for the long term for the glossaries and their entries. But it allows upvoting and downvoting and, and those sorts of things. Um, and um, is something that an, an ontology community working in, in a field might then mine um, for definitions and axioms. Yeah. That sounds great. So, uh, so there are some upcoming events. The um, Intelligent Systems for Geosciences group actually has a session at the AAAS, and this is a much bigger um, event than I really fully understood when we had our session accepted. Um, there will be lots of media there. Uh, we can anticipate pretty broad attendance. Um, it is, you know, a, it's a major national event for the science communities in the United States. It's also pretty big internationally. Um, it, I've added the link to our session um, on our agenda. Um, Yolanda, you'll see that there's been some, there have been some switches in who's talking and what they're talking about, but Yolanda has kindly offered to become one of our speakers together with uh, Vipin Kumar and Scott Peckham. They will each present um, moderately in-depth discussions about um, integrated modeling um, and intelligent systems roles in, in AI, kind of where it's going for the future, as well as uh, data, semantics, um, and machine learning will be some of those big topics. And then uh, Mary Hill is also part of the session. She's going to be a discussant, which means I was speaking with the AAAS folks today. The role of the discussant is to really be the person who not not necessarily presents a counterpoint, but presents an alternate perspective on the detailed topics that the speakers present on. And so we'll have a panel session at the end where um, we'll, we'll dive in. We've got some generative uh, questions that we'll ask the panel. Um, Mary will present briefly on her perspective on how artificial intelligence is impacting and changing the way we conduct and complete uh, water, water resources planning, management, and research, um, and it should be a very good session. I think that we're going to have opportunities to reach into a broader part of our communities, and um, so far it seems to be generating some excitement because I've already been contacted by some media folks from our campus and, and um, here in Austin. It is in Austin. Uh, let me know if you're interested in, in coming through because I'll do what I can to um, make your stay uh, ISGO amplified, if you will. Um, 
and uh, the website page for that event will be going up. I'll start sending out some announcements and tweeting about it. Uh, actually, I'll start doing that probably today. I'll start tweeting. I just received the media packet from AAAS. Um, there is also, as a follow-on in April, there's a water data workshop, and it's um, being funded by the Aspen Institute, the Meadows uh, Foundation, and the Mitchell Foundation. And what they're interested in is water data. And they're they're interested in water data nationally and how do we improve um, our management of water data and use of water data. Um, they talk about it in terms of data itself, but what they're really talking about is how do we use and apply our um, water data more intelligently. And so that will be hosted here at Texas Advanced Computing Center. I'm on the planning committee. Um, somehow I managed to squeak my way on there. And so I've been trying to insert ISGO participants as suggested invitees uh, wherever I can. And I will continue to do that. So I'll also make sure that we're there taking copious notes and uh, try to report back to this group just so that we can see the strategic direction that one use case community is going um, and, and how it might relate to the bigger vision of ISGO. Um, the EarthCube All Hands meeting should be on everybody's radar, and that's happening June 6th uh, through the 8th in DC. And again, let me know if you are interested in participating in EarthCube for the All Hands or presenting even better. Let me know because ISGO has um, some funding that we could support some travel to that. So uh, contact me. We would love to see posters and presentations. Um, I've posted the important dates there. The uh, call for abstracts should be going out pretty soon. Um, they were saying that in the last call I was on, they were aiming for this week. So hopefully you'll see something in your inboxes. If you're not on the EarthCube site, definitely go visit um, earthcube.org and sign yourself up and become a member of that community, which is what we are funded through. And then finally, uh, thank you. I think Anonymous Unicorn has saved me again. The IEMSS, the International Environmental Modeling and Simulation Society, has our uh, biannual meeting coming up in Colorado Springs. And that will be um, in June in Colorado Springs. It is a fantastic international community that's perfect for this particular group um, and our research interests. It's usually a very small, uh, about two, 150 to maybe 500 maximum participants, but participants from around the world, literally, these are talks that you will find people are ready to dig in deep and really talk about um, how an application um, can be used and the methods and the techniques, and they want to talk about it all in relationship to environmental applications. So, uh, anything Earth related is on the table. IEMSS is a natural fit for this group and, and their um, conference proceedings are peer reviewed and they are talking about how they'll distribute them this next time in hopes that everyone will get a DOI with their uh, full paper acceptance. It's an eight page conference paper kind of style. You can also do, they just decided, the board just decided a week or so ago that we will allow um, just straight abstracts, but they will not go into the final peer reviewed publication. So you can present with just an abstract, but you you won't get a publication out of that. Um, Suzanne, can yeah. I just Suzanne, can I just say it's a fabulous conference for those of you who are computer scientists um, or non geo people that are used to conference papers. Uh, they want just an abstract by February fifteenth. And then if the abstract gets accepted, then they will invite you to submit a paper. And then the paper gets reviewed, right? Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of the process. But it's a fabulous conference. I agree. I'm totally biased. It's also tied with the environmental, uh, uh, let's see, EMS, the Environmental Modeling and Simulation Journal, which is one of the top-ranked journals for, excuse me, modeling and uh, Sorry, I'm having a brain moment. Environmental Modeling and Software. It's one of the top ranked uh, peer reviewed journals for software and technology applied to environmental or earth resource types of problems. Um, I also want to just add quickly, I'm chairing a session where we're, we are looking at um, the juxtaposition between uh, decision support systems versus um, social processes. And so is the technology 
actually the thing that's pushing us over the edge or is it more important to focus on the personal and human relationships and is the technology just a part of that um, kind of, you know, enabling capability but enabling relationship building. And so talking about what's more, what's the role of technology in people basically, that technology human dyad that um, gets set up. Um, Okay, in the interest of, of moving forward and keeping us on time for our speaker, uh, I'll invite comments now from the working group, starting with Ime and Joe and our education group. Suzanne, can I, can I announce something? Oh, yes, real quick. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, sorry. I added it under news, but I just wanted to make everybody aware that we had a kickoff for a new project called the MINT for Model Integration. So it's in the agenda document. Uh, there's a URL pointing to it. And I wanted to announce it because it, it has been the result of a lot of the ISGO discussions. It involves many uh, people uh, that are in our community. So we welcome collaborators. This is a four-year project, pretty sizable. Uh, so we will be doing model integration from the point of view of um, providing um, ontologies, describing models, and providing catalogs. So model catalogs and then also uh, model data um, and workflow. So it's pretty comprehensive, but we welcome collaborators of, uh, of all kinds. So, so send me an email if you're interested. That, that's all I wanted to mention. Great. So Suzanne, this is Mike. Can I also make a really quick announcement? Sure, make the announcement. Go for it. Okay, so, and I know that this is a little bit late, but um, for those uh, who are familiar with uh, the NSF programs, uh, one called the Critical Zone Observatory, uh, the other is the Long-Term Ecological Research um, a Network, LTER, and then finally there's a National Ecological Observatory Network. These are three programs that are dealing with monitored watersheds and, mon and intensely monitored sites. They will all be getting together next week in Boulder, Colorado, to try and unify the ontology and uh, the data formatting for how the data are collected across these um, three separate programs, all of which are funded by the same agency, but none of which uh, communicate with one another. And the International Soil Modeling Consortium is going to be there to essentially try and help better map the data that's going to be synthesized into large-scale um, soil and kind of ecosystem models. And I just wanted to let this group know, you know this is sort of a geo group, that the soils and ecological community is also trying to deal with this problem as well. Uh, I'm happy to provide inf any information I'm on the program planning group. And although it's a little bit late now to invite people, I just wanted to let y'all know that this was, uh, this was also happening. And so there's a lot of synergies with what ISGO is trying to do. Yeah, if you can shoot me an email. I, um, I, would love to, I would love to have somebody from our project there. Thank you. Yeah, please, uh, please yeah, just send me an email so I can get the information, and then I'll find out if there's if there's room because there's there, there was just sort of limited seating and things like that in the room. Okay, thank you. That's great. Someone what else? are the dates of it? Uh, it is next. Uh, it's uh, February thirteenth to the fifteenth next week. Okay, thanks. Great. And we are plan and we are planning to issue you know white papers and an and an article in EOS and you know and just try to make some headway into this uh, the sticky problem. Great. Uh, Michael, would you mind coming back to this group and just giving us an update on that on the key outcomes that you observe while you're there? I think that'd be really useful for us. Oh, yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. So, uh, Ime, uh, how about let's move into working groups or Joe? All right. Um, let's keep it really short in the interest of time. The main message from the education group is please fill out the survey. If you teach any kind of course that's related to ISGEO, so anywhere at the intersection of the geosciences and intelligent systems, we would love to hear about your course. And so there's a short survey that's on the web page. Had we had sent it out earlier. Joe, I think, sent it out, and I followed up once. So we would still love to hear about your courses because they will most likely be featured in our paper where we would just describe what kind of different approaches they are and what you need to think about when you set up a course or what kind of resources there might be. So please take the time to fill that out. And also if you're interested in, in working with us on writing that paper, we'd love to have you. So send an email to Suzanne, to Joe, or to me. And Joe, um, uh, could you just, introduce yourself so that people know who you are and they have a face to associate with. Uh, 
fortunately, I don't have a camera, so there can't be a face, but um, uh, I'm Joe. I'm a staff member at the Oberlin College Department of Geology doing GIS work. And I'm working with the education group on this paper. Yep, and Joe's a rock star. He was one of our key participants in the uh, summer, um, the July event that we had this past, the training event. So uh, Joe and Ime are taking the lead on this and moving things forward so that uh, we can actually document all of the curricular content and resources that are becoming available for us. All right, uh, moving on to the um, group on cases. And since there are not many new people, let me just say, this is basically a group that's trying to implement uh, benchmarks and making them available benchmarks where we have a science question and we have data already available and we kind of try to write a description that computer scientists can understand so that they can really attack the problem relatively quickly. And this way we're hoping to get new collaborations focusing on these problems. And I think the main, main thing to announce for that group is that um, Ibrahim Demir is going to join the leadership. So he's a co-leader of the group in addition to David and myself. Ibrahim, do you want to say anything? No, I mean, just uh, thank you for the, the introduction and uh, we'll be happy to uh, help uh, continue the work with the, with the group, yeah. Okay, do you want to turn on your video for a moment so people know what you look like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't really set up the camera. I mean, I can just connect okay. maybe quickly. They can All go right. and see, they can go watch Ibrahim's video from his lecture uh, a couple of calls ago. I do want to just ask quickly, Ibrahim, while we have you, can you tell us uh, do you, how your uh, AI for Earth grant is going? And um, would you mind just giving like two sentences about what you're doing with your award and, and what's exciting about where it's going. Yeah, I mean, the idea is to, to communicate disaster information, especially flooding and coming from uh, forecast models, real-time data sets, and also a science uh, scientific warehouse to communicate this information to public decision makers. And we are trying to create AI applications for Skype, Messenger, Google Home, and all these different smart devices. And we are planning to launch the system uh, to public in a couple of months, I mean, hopefully in March. Fantastic. Oh my gosh. So it's running on Microsoft AI ecosystem right now. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, modeling work group. Yolanda's got a lot to report. Hi. So um, just to say that we will be starting the discussions on this modeling working group. Um, uh, and uh, we start next Monday, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific. And our focus will be to look at um, developing a repository of geoscience models with very deep semantic descriptions so that they can enable uh, scientists to not just find the models, uh, which there's repositories where you can do that today, but really compare them or find them based on, based on specific characteristics, really understand the modeling variables, the assumptions and the functions that they use. Um, so we're very excited to be able to uh, provide this repository and ultimately enable automatic composition of models, uh, automatic transformation of data to feed the models, and so on and so forth. So, so we're just going to start focusing on their repository. Anybody's welcome. I put the link to the um, to the mailing list. Uh, oh, I, I will add it now. Sorry about that. I'll add it uh, in a minute. Wonderful. Thank you, Yolanda. To check back on the agenda. All right, so we've got just a couple of minutes to wrap up. Um, I want to quickly. Uh, Suzanne, can, can I just say, um, and anybody is invited to any of these working groups. So, you know, just email us, the leaders of these working groups, email Suzanne if you want to be involved in any of them. She can direct you to the right people. So, exactly. Thank I'll you. Invite it. That's a, a critical point to make. Uh, we, we have a Twitter account. Um, I am willing to share access and control of the Twitter account. So just let me know if you are a tweeter. If you have a Twitter account, please follow us. If you've got news or things that you want us to tweet and talk about, um, let me know or tweet it and, and copy, uh, you know, mention us so that I can see it or whoever is managing and working with the Twitter account. Uh, I think I also created, we've got a Facebook account. Honestly, social media is a job unto itself and that leads into the next piece, which is um, our steering committee has agreed that we really need to um, do a better job of kind of marketing what we're doing, marketing all of the good things. The data benchmarks, for example, are fantastic. 
Um, so I have, I'm recruiting someone here. Um, I've been updating things as quickly as I can, but I've got a web person who's going to start helping me. Uh, and she helped me once before, but she's going to kick back in. Uh, the other thing that I want to just let everyone know is I'm, I'm teaching an ISGO class this semester, and I'll be teaching an, in, an intensive over the summer with a group from Petrobras in Brazil. And um, to help that, TAC is, has approved um, hiring for two folks. So some of them you'll already, one of them you'll already know, possibly Daniel Hardesty Lewis, who was one of the first ISGO um, exchange course students. And he's uh, just graduated with his degree in applied mathematics. And he's converted all of the groundwater models for the state of Texas into a Python, uh, into a version that's compatible now with Python libraries for automating uh, running and simulation of scenarios and, and um, just different kind of decision and, uh, and uncertainty relevant kinds of uh, testing and experimenting with those models, which I know there's a lot of knowledge on this call that I would love to engage with on how we go about doing that. And then the second person that's going to be a very visible part of this community soon is a young woman named Natalie Freed. She has an undergraduate degree in computing sciences from Arizona State University, and then she's got a master's degree from the MIT Media Lab. And she's actually interested. I, I think she's probably going to become very active in the education working group. Natalie is trained in programming, but her interests are lie in curricular design and development. So actually figuring out how to scaffold um, students and participants from one domain of expertise into another domain of expertise quickly and effectively. And she's really excited about machine learning. So she's helping me with my class right now, but she should be ramping on next week. And then from there, we expect that she'll be working with us, um, hopefully for the long term. So Natalie is someone to watch for and she'll be uh, popping up soon. And that will help us to push some things forward administratively here as well. Um, final thing before we turn it over and I ask Ime to introduce our speaker, um, is we need speakers. And there's so many exciting things happening. If you've got a project that you would like to highlight or if you'd like to get input from ISGO folks here um, who might have expertise that you really need to tap into, uh, volunteer. Let us know. We've got spaces available. I will tell you, uh, there's some visibility that comes with going onto the ISGO site, and it was really a joy for me at the AGU to actually have uh, two or three of our speakers that we already had videos of their lectures up and online um, get noticed with um, awards or announcements, and I was able to tweet out about them. So um, with Ibrahim being one of the, the major ones that as he was literally walking onto our session stage at AGU, uh, it was being tweeted from his institution that he'd won the uh, AI for Earth award from Microsoft. So some pretty exciting things. Uh, you'll be, your presentation will be online with a lot of other very accomplished researchers in ISGO themes. So with that, I will turn it over to our next accomplished ISGO lecture in our series. All right, let me just introduce him. So I hope I pronounced the name correctly. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Christoph Janovic, who is an associate professor for geographic information science and geoinformatics at geography department of the University of California at Santa Barbara. He also runs the STKO lab, which investigates the role of space and time for knowledge organization. In this talk, he will introduce the transformation process of converting the digital line graph from the USGS into linked data. With that, I turn it over to Christoph. Uh oh. Christoph, are you still there? Oh, there it is. Hello? Hmm. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, very good. So um, I'm going to present together with my student, Blake. This is our joint work. In fact, most of it is his work. And we are going to talk about some selected issues in translating 
um, parts of the USGS national map data set into linked data, talking a little bit about the data set, but also about the interesting findings or things that we had to do to make this happen. And you will see this is about more than just adding semantics to yet another data source. And of course, we are we are um, open to questions. And again, we're going to fly by most topics. So if you want to have uh, more details or learn more about what we are doing, please feel free to ask us. So I hope you can see my slides before we start. Here are some um, key issues that we plan to achieve. So this is a two-year collaboration with USGS, which is the US Geological Survey, to convert their national map data set more specifically. I am, I am so sorry to interrupt. This is Claudia. I just want to know if this is being recorded because I'm really interested in this. Otherwise, I'll record it from my computer. Hi, Claudia. Yes, we are recording it and it will be posted on the ISGO um, website after. Thank it. you for this interruption. I promise never to speak again ever. Thank you. <laughs> You know, thank you very much for saying this. Now that this is going to be recorded, I, I will put on my, my um, you know, smoother personality. <laughs> so, um, if you wouldn't mind, would you restart for the recording? I'll try oh, it. yeah, absolutely, okay. yes. I will go one slide back and just start. So, so sorry. ready to go? Yep, I'll so, start. Thank you very much for having us here. I'm going to present jointly with my student, Blake Regalia, who did most of the work together with me. And this is a collaboration together with USGS, the US Geological Survey, to take substantial parts of their data from the national map, more specifically the digital line graph, and translate it to linked data. And this is a progress report in which we try to highlight some things that we hope are interesting for the larger community. So before we dive into um, the talk, and this will be a brief overview talk, so whenever you have questions, then just let us know. Um, some facts here to consider. First of all, the task was to take the entire digital line graph data set, which is really, really big for the entire United States, and translate it into linked data. But also the task was not only to create, you know, to reduplicate what is already there in terms of geodatabases, shapefiles, and so forth in yet another format, but at the same time, highlight the value proposition of semantic web technologies to the broader audience and also USGS. Because after all, this project has a very important technology transfer component in which we try to take our research, the tools we developed, and the data to USGS in a way that they can host it for the many years to come. And that's, you know, by far, I guess, the most difficult part about the entire project. Um, because these are all new technologies, so there's not much experience at USGS how to deal with them. And that said, they are, they are very supportive in, in helping us getting this done. So the second key thing to consider here is that this had to be all open source and based on open standards, and it had to be scalable. So this is not just, uh, you know, taking some data, triplifying it, which means converting them into linked data, hosting them on some endpoint, and two weeks after you publish the paper, the endpoint dies. This is going to host more than 100 uh, gigabyte of data. In fact, I think it's 300 gigabyte data on the long term in a way that should scale, that should really support scientific applications. So it's quite a challenge. And um, to the very best of our knowledge, if we, if we are able to get this done, this would be the largest geo data set published yet as linked geo data. And I think it's fair to say it would be one of the largest data sets on the linked data cloud altogether. So this is substantially more than just triplifying data. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this and then Blake is going to jump in into the more technical part. So what we have done so far, or what we are just about uh, to do or doing right now is the following. What we have done first is we took all the data from the geographic names information systems, uh, GNS, and converted it to linked data. The GNS is a place, uh, place gazetteer. So it is all the locations of mountains, rivers, lakes, cities, and so forth in the United States, together with their geographic coordinates, historic notes, alternative names, elevation, and so forth. We took this data as a first step because later when we deal with more complex geometries, typically the way how humans use those geometries is by setting them or putting them in some relation to named geographic entities. So for instance, you would say, I'm interested in one specific segment of a larger 
body of water, for instance, a creek, a stream, or a river. So those names had to be in the system first. Then what we did in the next step, we took the resulting linked data set and aligned it with many of the existing repositories on the linked data cloud, GeoNames, DBpedia, Getty, ADL, um, and so forth. I think those are the ones that we have right now. The, the next step, and this is where it gets really complicated, is we had to understand, and by this I mean, you know, do a lot of, of research about understanding the traits of between storing data and computing data on the fly. And maybe this sounds like, what's the big deal here? But the problem is that many of the data sets that we have out there right now, like the places in DBpedia, they have some relations, like for instance, cardinal directions between places or population densities given the population and the area, but they either have them only for a subset of the data or there is inconsistencies with the data where the population has changed, but the population density wasn't updated. So we need to figure out, or we had to figure out which data to store, so to directly translate into linked data and which to compute on the fly. Unfortunately, Sparkle, so the query language of the semantic web and linked data doesn't support computing complex things on the fly. So we had to develop a um, transparent proxy as open source solution on top of that, that allows you to compute unseen properties without the user even noticing and this is open source and released also as a paper that we can point you to. Just to give you one example, if you would really like to have all the cardinal directions between places like DBPD has for like 200,000, this would lead in a combinatorial explosion of more than four, I believe, billion or trillion, Blake has the number somewhere, which would be larger than all of DBpedia together. So clearly just storing everything is not possible. The second thing that we had to address is the trade off between server-side and client-side storage and querying. So we have worked at STK with many industry partners before to triplify data, and we also have some large data sets out there in the linked data cloud. And the key thing also from observing, so I have a, I wear a second hat being the, the editor-in-chief of the Semantic Web Journal, and there we collect data set description papers, and we did a survey some time ago, how many of those data sets are still online in terms of having a Sparkle endpoint or another query endpoint. And it turns out more than 50% are already gone. So one of the reasons for this, and we are being, we've been told this over and over again, for instance, by industry partners, is that maintaining the server architecture for Sparkle query endpoints that are frequently used is really difficult and difficult from a scaling perspective and a financial perspective. So in this case, when we host so much data, we really had to find a way how we distribute the data in a way that you can download the entire data, for instance, as binary compressed RDF. If you don't want to query it, or that you can download the data in a way and then query on the client side so that the server doesn't have to do all the work of many, many researchers using this linked data set at the same time, and then have the simple queries run, for instance, on the server side for everybody who doesn't want to get involved into technology at all. I think Blake will briefly talk about this as well. We are just developing a first open source prototype and we are going to publish it later this year. One other thing that we had to do was to rethink how geometries are represented as linked data. In fact, we had to deviate from the GeoSparkle representation Blake is going to talk a little bit about this, so I'm not going to dive into details here. And then we had to define, you know, the, the geo-enabled user interfaces, georeferencing tools, ontologies, and so forth. And this is pretty, I guess, straightforward, so I'm going to skip over it and finally start converting digital line graph data about hydrology, transportation, borders, and whatnot into linked data. So moving on to the next slide, and from now on, it's just pretty pictures for you to to like. This is one example of the USGS data that is now online and accessible for you for one specific geographic item, namely the Lake Tobisovsky, or, you know, not exactly sure how to pronounce it, but something like this. We just picked a random geometry in, in Georgia because the data set that USGS gave us for testing in an early state was largely in Georgia. So what you can see here is that we have the type of the feature, that it's a reservoir, we have the lay, we have the name of the lake, we have the state it is in, we have the county it is in, the elevation, you can even click on this nice calculator symbol and get it mapped between feet and meters. We have the geometry, we have the change dates, we have alternative name citations and so forth. 
the elevation part is actually also one of those interesting cases where you have to ask ourselves whether you want to store something or compute something. So the original data set from USGS has the meters and the feet for the elevation, and we decided to only store one of them, and then the user can compute them using the interface on the fly. So this is the interface we are using here for dereferencing. You can also click on parts of the interface and get the RDF code. You can click on the state or the county and then navigate the interface as you're used to from other interfaces that are not geo-enabled. And this is all open source and you, you can also you deploy it on your own data set. Moving to the next um, slide, what we also have, and I mentioned this before, we don't only have the place names, like in this case, the lake associated with a point coordinate, for instance, somewhere in the center of the lake, but we also have the complex geometries from the digital line graph data here, the hydrography layer. And as you can see here, the geometry is already stored as linked data. We also store the bounding box, but we store the geometries not in a GeoSparkle compliant format, but a format that is slightly different. And Blake will give you in a few minutes all the reasons why we are doing this. For now, what matters, we have all the place names, more than 2 million in the United States, man-made features, natural features, and we are just triplifying all the digital line graph data hydrography, borders, transportation, whatnot, including complex geometries. So what we also had to add, and this may sound trivial, but it's a little bit more of a pain that, that I think we originally realized, is that the GNAS and also the digital line graph data is not easily integrated. So for instance, you can't do something like the typical follow your nose exploratory search where you click on one thing, you get to another, and then you get to another. So we had to introduce additional data, in fact, additional triples, and design the user interface in a way that you can do things like, for instance, click on a specific county here, BIP county, and then you see all the other features, for instance, airport, bridges, buildings, and um, churches, hospitals, and so on, lakes, located in this county, and then you can click on them and it unfolds, as you can see here for the streams, and you can pick your stream and continue browsing. So all of this is possible now with the data, and also with the, um, the user interface that we are providing. Again, all of this is open source, so we are happy if you, if you like it and you use it. The next slide that I wanted to show you highlights the relation between GNAS, so the geographic names information system that only has the point coordinates and the digital line graph data. And I think this is one of the most important parts or the part that hasn't been done so far. What you can see here is not the lake this time, but the creek with the same name that flows into the lake and the creek as such will just have one coordinate, so some sort of you know center point in the GNAS. And I hope you agree for lakes or streams or think about rivers like the Mississippi, a single center point where that's not telling you all that much. So this is where the digital line graph data comes into play with all the many segments that exactly trace the outline that you see here on the map of the creek. And now we use GNS to link them. So you see this on the left-hand side here. You have the information about the creek, its type being a stream, the state it is located in, the county, elevation and so forth, all the alternative names. But at the very bottom, the most important part, we have the fragment of relation, which associates every single fragment, and there are 114 of them, that is modeled in the digital line graph data to jointly compose this creek nicely linked for you so that you can pick them step by step and um, do whatever you like to do with them. So one other thing that, that we had to do aside of simply get the data into linked data was also to show and convince USGS and the, the larger community or broader community why you would care about this at all and why the GNS for instance was such an important first step. So what we did here in, and again I'm just showing you the pictures because showing the underlying triplets is hard to read. What we have done here is we took data from yet another data source of USGS, namely WaterWatch, which, re which reports water quality at certain measurement stations in the US. In fact, um, it's quite, in, quite a big data set itself. And we showed that we can link the observations of this WaterWatch data set to segments in the digital line graph data set 
the, and which is then linked to the creek with its name in the GNS. And what you also see here is that if you look at the USGS data, the way how this is structured is just as I told you, it has a name and then it has some geographic or topological relation, in this case, a metric relation to a city. So Macon, Georgia, for instance. And if we wouldn't have triplified the GNS data, you wouldn't know where this segment is. So we also captured by something that we call approximate topological relations and um, other similar relations. Those relations so that you know can say show me all the lakes or show me all um, streams in or near the city of Macon that have stations from the Water Watch project and show me for instance um, certain values that relate to water quality to give just one example. To, to model those stations we have used the new SOSA SSN ontology. This is the um, one of the first, in fact, the second ever ontology that is created as a joint standard by the OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium, and the World Wide Web Consortium. And it allows us to model the relation between sensors, observations, sampling, actuation, features of interest, uh, observed properties, measurement types, measurement procedures, and so forth. So we use this. This is what you see on the next slide to say that there's a um, water level observation at this creek, this is the, it has a certain result of being at 8.85 feet. It was taken on a certain date, like half a year ago by now. And you see all the information about the measurement being linked back to the creek. So now what you can do is you can say, select me all the stations in a certain county or measuring at a certain creek. Show me all the segments where the measurements take place. So the segment or the feature of interest, if you like, and show me all the measured variables there, which is pretty neat. And then the last thing showing why those same as relations, so why alignment to other data sources is important. I mentioned this at the very beginning. The USGS data stops, so to speak, when you select the geometries, you select your measurements from some data source or from some sensor, and then the geographic names. What you can't do is you can't say, show me the water quality of all rivers running through towns that have more than 150,000 people living there, because the population is simply not part of the USGS data. Or you can't say, show me all you know, rivers and the water quality of cities that are governed by, I don't know, Republicans or Democrats. But all the data is there. We can ask all these questions, but we have to link out to data sets that answer these questions. And in this case, this is DBpedia, which has the area of the population density, the population counts, political parties, known figures, and so forth. So we mined um, same as relationships between most or many of the USGS features and the features in DBpedia, GeoNames, um, Getty, AD, L, and so, uh, and so forth, to allow you to do exactly this, to ask those queries that span across multiple data sources. So here, for instance, you see me clicking. I, let me go one slide back. You see here our data set for making at the very end, you see that there's a sameness relation to the DBpedia ontology and data set. And then once you click on this, this is exactly what you get, you see, uh, the mayor, you see the population total, the population in the metro area, and so on and so forth. So this is what we did on the interface and, and data side. And Blake is now going to take over and report on some of the reasons why we had to change the ways how we do it in GeoSparkle and so on. Blake, do you want to continue and then tell me when to advance the slides or do you want to start your own screen yep, share? that works. Okay, so just tell yeah. me when uh, to advance the slides. Sure. Yeah, it's only a few slides. Yep. So um, I'm just going to give a, uh, a technical overview of um, some of the things that um, Yano talked about that we ended up um, sort of discovering um, were major challenges um, to use in practice um, when trying to represent, you know, these tons and tons of geometries as linked data. Um, just to start off with a little bit of background, the triplification pipeline for the USGS data, and I need to make an amendment to the slide. Actually, this is just talking about for data that includes geometries. There's also a lot of data that we get from USGS that is in uh, CSV 
format, so already flat. But just for the um, geospatial data that we get, it starts in a geodatabase format. Uh, we simply load this into a PostgreSQL database um, with PostGIS, which uh, anyone familiar with you know, working with geospatial data has probably, um, this is one of the main database, uh, relational database systems used. Uh, and then uh, the triplification process is um, a suite of scripts that we um, developed um, to basically just convert these databases um, into uh, RDF uh, using a bunch of rules, configurations, and ontologies that we defined um, specifically for each one of the USGS um, data sets. Um, and, all, and for this example, um, I'm going to talk about one specific data set. So let's go to the next slide. So, um, like I was, I'm saying, the USGS geometry data has many, many high-resolution polylines and polygons. Um, and if we were to just conform to the GeoSparkle standards, um, we would um, yet also serve this data in a way that users would be able to, um, you know, make geospatial queries um, and uh, and we could perform many geospatial queries without overloading the system. Um, essentially, what the triple store would need to do is store um, one copy of the geometry in a binary format, um, in addition to uh, the human readable format that GeoSparkle specification calls for, um, one of which is G uh, GML, another is uh, well-known text, um, and I believe that the next version is aiming to support GeoJSON. But the, the bottom point is, is that um, RDF literals uh, are uh, storing tons of um, textual characters for these geometries, and it ends up um, creating a two and a half times increase in storage requirement. So um, the pictures that you see here, the one on the left, is uh, just the National Hydrology Dataset Geometries for California, um, which takes up uh, three gigabytes in its binary format. And um, if you were to also store this in a triple store with its RDF literal human readable representation, it would cost a total whopping 7.5 gigabytes. Um, and then uh, on the right side, this is just um, actually the well-known text serialization for that lake that we talked about earlier, the Lake uh, to Tobisov to Tobisovsky, <laughs> um, which is 97 kilobytes. And the, the, the illustration here is just that uh, this is supposedly a human readable format, but um, there's no way that anyone is looking at this long string of coordinates and deriving some significance from that text. So it, it's really not actually human readable. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So uh, just to reiterate, uh, the problems we see with these human readable serializations for geometry that GeoSparkle calls for is that it, on average, it requires approximately two and a half times the amount of storage um, as its binary equivalent. Uh, these long strings offer no clarity to uh, users because they are not human readable. Um, those literals actually serve no purpose to the uh, spatial querying uh, process because the systems are using the binary formats of those geometries anyway. Um, <clears throat> and also, you know, we kind of wonder, well, these RDF literals aren't e even that well suited for transmission. So if a user wanted to download copies of these spatial features, um, you know, why would they be wanting to download them in, in, a, in a human readable serialization when they could just get them in a binary format instead and load them into their own um, GIS. So instead, our approach, which we nicknamed AGO, is basically, okay, let's eliminate the need to store the human readable representations. They're not even that useful. Um, and if we take an alternative, you know, what are the benefits we can get of that? Uh, and instead, what we say is that we're going to require that each geometry has its own unique dereferenceable IRI. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. And so 
Um, what does that look like? Well, instead of storing, um, for example, the well-known text serialization um, inside of a blank node, uh, we say just uh, give each geom uh, geometric feature its own IRI. Uh, and if a user were to um, dereference that, that, that IRI, in other words, if they were to make an HTTP request, they would have um, the option of downloading that geometry in um, any format uh, so long as the server is able to convert the, the geometry into that format. So in this example, um, at the bottom half of the page here, we're showing a curl request to um, one of those geometry IRIs where basically we're saying these are you know, just five um, formats that our server supports, which includes um, if you dereference it and ask for HTML, you'll get the web interface, which um, displays it on, an, on a nice interactive map for you. If you ask for well-known text, you'll get well-known text back. If you ask for GML, we can do that. GeoJSON, well-known binary. So really any format, um, which is um, already much more diverse than what you could get out of um, simply just using GeoSparkle. Um, and by the way, just to, um, you know, just to be fair here, we're not saying that this is the end all solution for, for all geometries. Um, you know, simple point features where you have just one coordinate um, or bounding boxes where you only have four coordinates, um, it, you know, it's still very appropriate to use um, well-known text and RDF literals. Um, and in fact, our approach is actually complementary to GeoSparkle. So both of these methods can coexist together. Um, it's just that because um, some, of the, some of the things we do by not using literals and not using the same predicate, um, you know, we're actually in violation of the GeoSparkle specification, but it can actually coexist. So we, we just leave it at, you know, for geometries beyond point features and bounding boxes. So polylines, polygons, and, um, and uh, uh, multi-features, you know, this is this, the approach that we take. And by the way, this is also makes it easier and more efficient for web applications um, that are consuming linked data and, you know, will have the need to, uh, to display these geometries on demand very quickly. Um, this is very uh, compatible with, with those types of applications. Uh, so if we could just go to the, the last slide here, um, this is just to summarize, uh, you know, what are the, the features, the pros and cons, how does our approach compare to the others? And um, so on, on that middle column there, we have GeoSparkle, and um, by the way, NeoGeo um, was actually one of the um, competing uh, standards that that uh, draft that was drafted before GeoSparkle um, that sort of you know at, brought up some of these ideas of you know well what if we can support content negotiation and you know what if we model the entire geometry you know as an RDF structure um, and ultimately I lost out against GeoSparkle for a number of reasons but um, some of the lessons learned from from both of those we found a way to sort of glean the best of both worlds. So um, just going down the list here, our approach, yes, we allow for efficient geometry storage, only the, we only store the binary format. Um, another thing that I didn't mention before is that the geometry can exist externally. So for example, if, uh, if we publish all of our USGS digital line graph geometries uh, on the USGS server, other, um, uh, hosts on the linked data web can reference those geometries in their own data sets and without actually having to copy the entire uh, geometries from our servers. Um, and this, is, this actually maximizes the reusability of geometric data. Um, they, they can still copy and clone them and host them, or they can you know, decide to just reference them externally um, and then the geometries can, can persist there. Uh, we also, of course, support content negotiation, so any format that the server supports that the user can get. Um, we have a uniform RDF structure, just as with GeoSparkle, so a very predictable um, leaf node about where the geometry exists when you're writing a Sparkle query. Um, we also support composite geometries where you can create um, sort of like super sets of, of features 
uh, such as a collection of um, of points. You know, you can basically describe a uh, a feature as a collection of other geometries. Uh, we also allow uh, for uh, to, to basically determine what is the geometric type. Again, this is the same as GeoSparkle because um, Geos, you know, we're we're not uh, saying that, that that you need to. Um, if you already have GeoSparkle, it's not that you can't also support AGO. If you're using GeoSparkle, you can apply a few things and also support um, um, our approach. Uh, access the bounding box. Again, you know, you can have a, a geospatial feature, but you can also have a triple that basically says, this is the well-known text that describes the bounding box of that feature. And then finally, the only thing that you don't get with our approach is just the fact that you're not going to get the raw geometry from the RDF data alone. To get that, you need to dereference it, and we see this actually as a um, as a benefit or a feature. And uh, I think with that, I'll hand it back over to Yano, um, and he can uh, ask four questions or or whatnot. And uh, thank you for your time. Yeah, I think that's everything that we wanted to highlight. There's it's more to talk about the proxy or something like this, but you know, if you have questions, then then please ask. Thank you. That was a great uh, presentation. Are there any questions? Um, this is Claudia. Uh, I really love the presentation. I was just wondering about um, the, the second part of the presentation about your, your format. And uh, what about the links to this, all this geometry? Do you have any strategy to make them available at the same time or does AGO uh, only uh, take care of geometry features? Um, could you uh, elaborate on that? I'm not sure what you mean by the, yeah, because the, links. the The thing is the first part of the talk, that's the way you understood it, okay? First part of the talk was very much about getting everything together linked to geometry data. Okay, using, that's as far as I could understand and see it. You have kind of a basis, which is the USGS um, uh, topologic data. Uh, and then on top of it, you start linking with lots of other uh, sources so that you get lots of additional semantic information. And then you, uh, Blake, presented um, a way of uh, storing and managing and serving geometry features. But to me, the, uh, what you were talking about has nothing to do with linked data. Or did I get it completely wrong? Blake, may I answer this and then you jump in? Sure. So I, I, this is a very good question. Thanks for asking. So, you know, we try to make this a, a brief talk. So maybe this didn't get across that way. So if you take geometries of all those digital line graph data items like the lake or the GNS data like the place names and you translate it to link data following GeoSparkle, then what you have essentially done is you hide the geometry typically in a string like a well-known text string. And while you can certainly use it as a human reader to, you know, to read it. And as we showed in the example here, maybe I can zoom in a little bit. We question the meaningfulness of this. Nobody's going to read, you know, 100 pages of, of coordinate pairs to understand the geometry of the, the Lake Tobosovsky. You can also, the human use is, I guess, out of question. You can also do inferencing with it, like ask topological relations from within your Sparkle endpoint, but you can't reuse the geometry. So this is exactly what you said. You can't say, why should DBpedia and GeoNames and whatever other research projects or data sets all store the same data set geometries if we have an authoritative data set from USGS that is highly accurate and well maintained, but you can't reuse them. You have to copy over the entire geometry. And this is exactly the, the proposal of our uh, AGEO. So the geometry becomes its own object stored under its own a unique identifier and thereby you can reuse the very same one. Let me give you, you know, one tiny example. Uh, the city of Berlin in Germany, which is the capital of Germany, and the state, the federal state of Berlin, they have exactly the same footprint, right? But you can't say this 
in GeoSparkle easily if you use their well-known text strategy. There are, of course, other ways of doing so. This is what the overview table summarized. But the key part here of what Blake did is that we are using URIs to refer to these data sets and thereby we are able to, to interlink geometries directly. Okay, thank you. Is this accurate, your yes. time, Blake? Yes. Great, are there any other questions? One question I've got, so um, in terms of implementing it, if someone were to go and use the open source repository, um, what kinds of support might be available or is it, is it pretty much just a find the, find the, the code, download the code and, and see if you can make it work in terms of documentation, user support or anything like that? Are there any plans for that kind of thing? Blake, you want to take this one? Yeah, so um, all of the, like we said, this project is open source. And uh, we, oh, hey. Um, and we transfer it over to USGS for the, uh, yeah, sorry, one second. Sorry, it's just the, the headphones. <laughs> uh, just a, something happening here. Um, so, uh, we, so once we transfer this to USGS, they have long-term uh, maintenance requirements for for maintaining um, the servers, the software, the endpoints, um, and that's you know that's guaranteed uh, as a U.S. federal agency um, as part of their policy. Um, now, in terms of you know how since we're sort of deviating from um, an already established standard question becomes, well, how can we make sure that this is supported and understood by users if we're going to invent, um, you know, an alternative approach? And the, the answer to that is, well, um, we need, we actually need to define a, a standard. We need to create a specification. This has been early research um, to experiment with this. Um, you know, we've brought this idea up um, at a few conferences. We've gotten feedback. We've already improved. Um, our approach based on the feedback that we've gotten um, and it is a process that is um, you know that is trying to to get better uh, and so yes ultimately um, for, for this specific approach um, I, I would say it needs to become um, a, a w3c recommendation um, or or adapted into the OG an OGC consortium standard um, and it's going to take a uh, you know, a lot of convincing because it is very different from what GeoSparkle has spent a lot of time setting up. Um, and, but, you know, we're hoping to at least demonstrate that this is, you know, something that we learned um, publishing the, the largest geospatial link data set uh, on the planet. <laughs> and these are, you know, the things that in practice, um, you know, were the only ways that, that we could actually support um, having such a large um, data set while still supporting geospatial querying, topological relations, um, inf uh, inferencing, and, um, and so forth. So does that answer the question? Yeah, I think, that's a, I think that's a great response and puts it in the context of how this particular approach is, is entering into the existing, well, I guess it's almost re-entering because of the way that it developed and then kind of was a little bit truncated or, or pushed aside and now it's kind of coming back in it sounds like which is really neat and it does sound like there's a lot of complementary aspects between the two approaches which is going to be fun to see unfold um, if there are no other urgent or critical questions i suspect that our speakers would welcome contact and follow-up emails if you if you want to follow up with them um, individually I'd like to thank everyone. This has been a really nice turnout for today's talk, um, which is evidence of how interesting the topic is and how useful and timely. So uh, we will be having the, the teleconference uh, the first Tuesday of March and an announcement will go out. Please uh, join our listserv or reach out to me directly. Um, you can find 
ways to link to us at is-geo.org. And um, thanks for coming, everyone. And good luck with uh, everything happening in your lives in the coming weeks. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much for Thank having you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank this you. was great. Thank you so much. I never showed my face. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> am I there? Oh, no. Where am I? Yes, I'm here. Hello. <laughs> Goodbye. Nice meeting you. See you next time.